Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, will problems with the Maryland Healthcare Exchange create political opportunities in the Maryland governor's race? Heather Mazur says, let's get stoned. Should marijuana be legalized in Maryland? Should the Bethesda Regal Cinema be torn down for metro expansion? And which had greater impact on our country and state, the Gettysburg Address or the Kennedy assassination? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by the president of Progressive Maryland, Elbridge James, Republican attorney Jim Shalek, Republican activist Jerry Cave, and Democratic activist Susan Heltimus. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Once touted by President Barack Obama as the model for the nation, the Maryland Health Exchange is wrestling with the same problems plaguing the national rollout of Obamacare. While headlines are focused on the online technological problems, the hidden story is the anemic number of consumers who've been able to sign up on the health care exchange. Elbridge, is the problem a techie problem, or is the problem a, that the program has been mismanaged from the very start, and this is why so few people are signing up? It's a large but technical problem. We have more people signing up in November than are signed up in October. And so it is getting better. But it's, let's face it, it is a problem that has to be corrected. Well, hopefully, the fact that everybody's looking at health care now as something that everyone should have, and then everybody should get on board and say, let's get this done and get it done right. I like the Republicans now that are saying, rather than saying, let's scrap everything, let's make it work. And that's what everybody's focusing on. Let's make it work. All right. Well, once once this once the program starts working, Susan, politicians they're who are running for office are like hungry sharks. They're looking for weaknesses in all their opponents. Now, Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown has been in charge of the program, and he's admitted that the Maryland Exchange well, stumbled coming out of the gate. So, is it any surprise that Attorney General Doug Gansler is attacking him for his handling of the program? Um, it's not surprising because because Doug Gansler needs something to get himself out of the hole because he has had a lot of bad press. But I have said it over and over again. I personally am getting health care through the Maryland Exchange. But I'm not going to sign up until after Thanksgiving because once you sign up, you have to pay. So there are a lot of people like me out there who are waiting. Mm -hmm. We'll pay for our well, December. But the, but, the question, but the question really is a political question, Susan. Is, is the, the question is whether or not Doug Gansler has, an, has a political opportunity to weaken Anthony Brown. No, he doesn't really. It, this is a minor thing. It's working pretty well. And in the large scheme of things, when next primary comes next June, it's nothing. It's a minor blip now, but Doug Gansler's got to latch on to something else. Jerry. Nothing to kill a bad product faster than good advertising. And because you have a bad experience with the product and you don't want to buy it again and you don't want to buy it from that retailer. So Democrats are going to have a, a lot of problems with Obamacare because this website's the least of the problem. But it will not be problems, I think, in the primary, but it will in the general. K Jim. Casey, I, I think most people look at this as a national issue, Obamacare nationally. I don't think it's going to affect local elections. And don't forget, the primary is seven months away. The general election is a year away. In politics, a week can be a lifetime. And, well, I but, think Jim, I wanna, I, but Jim, if, if, if people are still continuing to have problems and are unable to sign up, but more importantly, are finding that the policies aren't affordable, isn't that going to have a lasting impact on the go gubernatorial race? Yes, to some extent. But I think by then people are going to be tired of it as a hot issue. There's going to be more and more hot issues between now and the election. And people's memories are very short. Susan, the, the, they always say in politics that, that pocketbook issues are the ones that really get people angry. The problem that, that most people are finding is that health care plans aren't affordable and that the plans that they have to replace are costing more. Um, that's not true when you uh, really look at the policies. Like, for instance, the policy I'm getting costs less. But I heard a very interesting conversation this week about people who had policies that were less expensive. 
but then they read the fine print of their policies and they found out it was only for accidents and then it didn't cover maternity and it didn't cover this. So people who have these cheap policies, this has focused them on better read the fine print because you may have a cheap policy, but it isn't covering much. And that's in the long term is going to help the Democrats. You, got, you guys are living in illusion. This thing is a nightmare. People are losing their health care. These plans are bad. And it really is going to hit the fan next October when it kicks in for where most people have their health care insurance, which is through their businesses. And that's going to happen 34 days before the general election. Look, I don't think, I mean, I think the big, go ahead, Elbridge. Let's see. I, Wrap I, it up for I, us. Good. I believe, in fact, is that as a, an intelligent organization, the federal government, like the business community, can find a way to make it work. And it's Cause working. Because it, it will it's be a disaster. It's getting better every day. It, it will be a disaster if no one works on it. Have the government called an intelligent organization? <laughs> well, <laughs> look, look, we're going to have to end it up, end it here. But Keep us. You just don't care. give up, Casey, on this, do you? <laughs> well, I, I think it's a disaster. I think it's been a disaster for the past four years, and, the, and the, the Democratic Congress should be ashamed of themselves for not listening to the industry and not listening to the Republicans who wanted to improve the bill when it was being passed. This is a disgrace, and, we, and we're all going to suffer for, from, from this disgrace for the next five years while this thing gets fixed. That's why I don't give up on it, Susan. But it will get fixed. It is getting will, fixed. And the thing is, is we'll this week, yeah. again, <laughs> the polls that were but, taken, people don't want Obamacare. They describe the same thing later as health care reform, Susan, and people are supporting Susan, it. It is, is a, a demonization Susan, of Obama. Susan, it is a fiction. Oh, it is not a demonization of Obama. It is a, it is a demonization of our, of our health care in this country. We are expecting young people to pay for the, the health care costs of older people, and no one is going to sign up for that bad They're boy. not going to do it. They're not going to do it. This is going to, this is, it's going to end up being and, and a tax on the American people, and it's going to be terrible. And it's going to destroy the Democratic Party. You can't have the last word, Jerry. He just did. He just did. <laughs> All right. We're going to go on to the plan that, governor, that gubernatorial candidate Heather Mazur has for grabbing headlines. And this week, she announced that in order to address Maryland's deficit issues, she's advocating the legalization of marijuana use. And by the way, we should just tax it like tobacco and alcohol. Now, proponents of legalized pot say the marijuana industry is one of the business sectors that's growing in the United States and helping the economy by creating small business jobs and expanding tax, tax revenues. Jerry, should the state of Maryland follow Colorado and Washington and legalize marijuana to solve our budget woes. There is nothing good about the drugs that are currently classified as illegal. They are nothing but bad news. This one is a gateway drug and you don't and you'd have to be completely in a state of denial not to have witnessed the kind of damage that's happened to our society since they've had drugs get into the workplace. And to then make it legal and more accessible is completely stupid. It's bad for our young people. It's bad across the world. We all know people that have smoked pot till they're our age. And you know what happens to them? They get stupider. And I know this because some of them used to be smarter than me, and now I'm smarter than them. And the difference is they've been smoking pot their whole life. This is terrible. Absolutely, horrifically terrible. Jim, same question. Uh, Jerry, I can't argue with Jerry. He's 100% right. As a prosecutor for years, I saw young men and women who were, got stoned on heroin, cocaine, and they all started with marijuana. It's a gateway drug. It's the first step into more serious drug use. It's and more and more kids are going to use marijuana. They're going to get behind a wheel. There's going to be more car accidents. Legalizing marijuana is a terrible idea. And I, I, I think she's just doing it for headlines, Missouri. And she's getting them, but it's a terrible idea. Jerry, it was, it was a gateway drug because the hemp industry made it a gateway drug. This wasn't a natural association between opium, heroin, and marijuana. If you read your history, the hemp industry were afraid of, in fact, what the marijuana plants and their use other than smoking could do, and they made the whole plant, the whole plant illegal. Well, so are you in favor of legalization? I'm not in favor of legalization. I'm in favor of decriminalization. And there are more important things that need to be done before, in fact, you legalize marijuana. And I agree because there are many, many young people and older people who are thrown in jail and become more hardened criminals Correct. because of marijuana. And I think we need to revisit 
the if, penalties uh, for marijuana well, no, rather than legalizing. No, Susan, Susan's right. I mean, a first-time offender with a small amount of marijuana, I don't think anybody calls for them to go to jail. Treatment is the answer. But th the problem is if you legalize it, more people will use it and it will expose them to the feeling of being high and they'll move on to cocaine and heroin. And it, it's just Do a bad... Do we have the same effect with alcohol? Do we have the same effect with alcohol? It's not analogous. Do, do, you can go have one or two drinks and it's fine, but people don't smoke pot and have one or two. They go and they get stoned. And if you may legalize it, you're given an imprimatur from society and well, the state I don't think that it's okay. We it's don't stupid. disagree with you, but, yeah. but, but Elbridge and I both agree that we need to revisit the penalties for marijuana. The thing that's supposed to happen is okay, to right. not use illegal drugs. Wait a minute. Jim, you're, you, you're a defense attorney. What, oh, is, what, is, what, is, what is the penalty for a first-time offender today having a de minimis amount of, of marijuana? Well, in, in Montgomery County, which is very progressive, they have these diversion programs where you go to a program, they test your urine, you go to classes, you do some community service. But outside of Montgomery and County, And at the end though. of it, the case will be dropped if you complete this treatment education program. So Montgomery County is very progressive. But what, if you, what about the other jurisdictions, though? In most jurisdictions that, that don't have diversion programs, the penalty is generally a, a, a small fine, generally in most jurisdictions. Uh, also, the point, the fact is that we're looking at drug use. Drug use that, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens when, in fact, there's low employment, there's poor housing, there are other things that turn around and create an environment where drug use now becomes the optimum way to and escape. And it also depends My kids on. My went to parties out in Potomac, which is not low income, and it wasn't just the kids smoking pot, it was the parents smoking well, see, pot. But you're talking, and other but you're talking about the 10%. I'm talking about the 90%. No, you're saying that it's only a problem in the poor communities. Using illegal drugs is bad in all of our communities. Well, what, what I find most troubling about Missouri's pr proposition is she wants to legalize it so she can tax it. In other words, she wants to well, legalize drugs if you're gonna, to get taxes. Well, what she's saying, if people are going to use it, the state might as well make some money off all of right. it. All right. We've got to cut this one off. None of us think it's a good idea to legalize. So for once in this whole entire year, I think we're all in agreement on something. When we come back from a short break, should Montgomery County tear down the Bethesda Regal Cinema Building for metro expansion? And which had a greater impact on our state, the Gettysburg Address or the Kennedy assassination? Stay tuned. Welcome back. The Founding Fathers enacted constitutional protections to limit how the federal government could seize private property of an individual. These federal protections of how, when, and why a government can take private property have been debated and litigated for the past 200 years. Jerry, in 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that local governments could seize through eminent domain private property for economic development. Now, just down the road in Bethesda, county planners want to tear down the Apex Building most famously known by some as the home of Regal Theaters, which is a 170,000 square foot building and according to state records, valued at $43 million. They want to do it for metro expansion. What do you think of that, Jerry? Well, I'm geographically qualified to speak on this topic because 60 years ago, before it was the Apex uh, building, the sign for my father's dealership, K Ford, sat right there on that corner. And I think they ought to put my son, anyway, they shouldn't put a sign. Listen, I don't like eminent domain, but when it's for transportation, and I hate to use this phrase for the common good, when it's for transportation, it is understandable. And, and if it makes this purple line work and connect to the, to the red line, then, then I'm for that. What I don't like is eminent domain to give it to one other merchant uh, so that he can make more money and pay more taxes. But, and, and, I'm a, and what I'm really afraid of is that I may be in agreement with the Democrats here Today. Jerry, Duh. and at the risk of that, I will still hold with my position. But they should put my father's Jerry, sign there, back There is first. nothing obsolete about the Apex building. It is a functional building. It provides services for people. It provides economic. There's no for disagreement, people. but it's no but different than putting a road through a guy's farm. <laughs> the corn <laughs> still grows. Who's it's paying that the forty-three million dollars, Jerry? It's a forty-three million dollar building. I'm glad you asked that question. The federal government caused the traffic problem in Bethesda and Montgomery County, and they should play for the resolution of the problem. Right. So at the risk of agreeing with Jerry, Susan, 
does it make sense to tear down a building where there are already hundreds of businesses in operation, a building that costs it valued at $43 million, and that produces $600,000 a year in taxes. Absolutely. Okay. You are talking to someone who was on the original Georgetown Branch Task Force, and throughout this planning, there was always going to be a terminus in Bethesda okay. where the purple line would meet the red line, and this is where it would be. Is there it, an alternative location? Susan. Not with the current plan, no. And the thing is, is that when <laughs> this... With the current plan, of course. We... So the, but Casey, what will happen is the plans are to tear it down, put in this terminus where purple and red line meet, and then there will be even denser development. I don't see anything wrong with it. It happens all the time. As Jerry said, for once we agree for the common good, get over it, it's going to happen. It's, it's, it's all about <laughs> private property rights. Why yes. does the government have the right to take the private because property it's public of, an, of an individual. Oh, it's public, it's tra public transportation. That's right. Oh, isn't that sacrosanct? Well, you know what? People at the golf course say, God forbid you're going to go through our golf course or, you know, you're going to do this or that. It is for the common good. And the, when the purple and the red line meet, it's the one thing that this county has been missing. When the subway was original and Metro was planned, it was north and south spokes out of Look, the this district. Is this, is east, west, this is such nonsense. This is east, west, nonsense. This is nonsense. You're wrong, Casey. Well, you're wrong. K Jim. Casey, I, I want to see if there's alternatives. I think you hit the nail on the head. What, they, there's got to be alternatives to this. This is a vibrant, tax-producing, vibrant business area, and I think well, there's got to be alternatives. There's a red line. There aren't that many spots where the red we're, line will... We're not talking excited. about the biggest alternative, which is the fact the state of Maryland's not going to spend one nickel to You know, I, I question the transportation. Look, you look at the Silver Spring Transit Center, which is a disaster, disgrace, two years over built, uh, two years what overdue. does that have to do with I, these purple and red line? Because I don't know if they, they know what they're doing. Bingo! This Thank plan, you, Jim. This, I appreciate that. That and plan, we're, Susan. I see you're my wrong, point Casey. of Brother <laughs> I'm not wrong. You I are wrong, Casey. You again. know I'm nothing rather. about the purple and the red line. All I need to know, Susan, is that government is, is taking the private property Taking or paying? Taking, and they may be paying. They will pay. They, they, will, they pay. will pay they for that. Paying. They and, will pay. For and the owners will go to the bank on that. Oh, that's and, right. And, that's, and, that's and we will have something bigger and better. And our great-grandchildren will get to use opens, the purple It opens line. up the door for <laughs> Maybe. government to seize more private property. Watch out, Casey. They're coming to get you. <laughs> well, no. The, actually, the producer is coming to get us because we've run over out of time. All right. This week. Our country was confronted with two very significant historical markers. That being the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address on, on Monday the 19th, and today on the 22nd, the 50th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's assassination. Now each event is important and each event is viewed differently by all of us. Now the question for the panel is, which is the more significant event to you, and we're going to start with Susan. Um, it's like comparing apples and oranges for me. First of all, as an English major, I view the Gettysburg Address as one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that's ever written. Whenever I get a book of speeches, I reread it. When I go to the Lincoln Monument, I read it. Um, this summer, I was at, at Gettysburg. I think it is beautiful. It is going to go down in history as one of the best pieces of literature ever written. When I look at the assassination of John F. Kennedy, I was a little girl in Catholic school. And the election of John F. Kennedy as the first Catholic president meant a big deal in my family. And there are anecdotal stories. We had a picture of John F. Kennedy and the Pope in our home. And it was the biggest, most wonderful thing. Um, when it happened, I remember where I was. Father Tarman came in and said, the president has been shot and, and may be dead. This man spoke against John F. Kennedy, all, but at that point we were all united as Catholics, and we got four days off from school, and I watch TV every day, and it will be a memory, um, but John F. Kennedy died, we moved on. I will probably have longer feelings towards the Gettysburg Address. Thank you, Susan. Jerry. The wor one of the several worst events of my lifetime is the assassination of John Kennedy. Uh, it had historical consequences that we can't really 
described because we don't know what would happen if he had lived. Um, the Gettysburg Address is very significant in our history, but it is not as significant as the actual assassination of Kennedy. What was significant is, was the battle and uh, who won that battle. And the whole Civil War, which was just about the worst possible way to resolve the horrible conflicts that we had at that time. And um, I have a relation to that, too, because my great-grandfather survived uh, the battle at Gettysburg. And the, the Civil War killed 600,000 Americans. One out of every three white men in the South was killed or maimed. The hatred and the animosity. And my great-grandfather lost almost all of his friends and family in that conflict. And the ramifications lasted 100 years. It impoverished half our country for 100 years and left hatred behind. Uh, the, at the assassination was worse than the address, but the, the Civil War as was the worst event that happened in our country. It was the worst way to resolve these horrible conflicts. Jim. Well, th to me, the, the Gettysburg Address was an uplifting, unifying statement by a great president, the greatest president, unifying our country, moving forward from a horrible division, north and south. To me, the Gettysburg Address and Lincoln's efforts were uplifting and good. The Kennedy assassination, to me, has always been nothing but bad and horrible. Reminds us of, of the violence in this country. Martin Luther King was killed. Robert Kennedy was killed. John Kennedy was killed. This is a violent country, and every time something horrible like that happens, to me, it's just all bad. So I have no good feelings. I take nothing good in my experience or life from the Kennedy assassination. It's just a horrible <laughs> event. I can't even watch it on TV. It's, it's just a horrible thing. Nothing good on that. Thank you, Jim. Elbridge. The, the, the outcome of the uh, Gettysburg Address was because of the battle. And let's face it, if the battle had not been won, he wouldn't have had the Gettysburg Address. But the Gettysburg Address set part of the foundation that the president and the country moved on to, in fact, explain why we were in war. The assassination was so horrible to us that it said to every one of us, we have to have hope where there is no hope. And we have to go on and become good civil servants to live out that legacy where the man and the Camelot was so good for all of us. We put back the horrors and we face horrors every day now. But it's because of the assassination and because of the reasons why we had a great president that we decided, I go forward. Well, you know, I, the reason I chose this topic the way I did is for me, the beauty, as Susan pointed out, of the Gettysburg Address is that it is a, a stunning summation, mm -hmm. I think, of the American founding principles. Mm -hmm. That government by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. The American experience and the American experiment is so unique, we have to cherish, cherish it forever. The Kennedy assassination was such a pivotal point also in our lives that we've experienced mm -hmm. and uh, as, as young people and continue to live throughout th these days. It was a shocking event that our government, our head of government, could be brought down by someone in such a manner mm -hmm. that it was, mm -hmm. it was the lasting impact and the lasting legacy. And yes, we can, we, can, we can all debate whether John F. Kennedy was great, great president, an imperfect president, a president who didn't see his fulfillment, but there is no doubt that his death had an impact on us oh, all. Yes. The fact that it came this week, where both dates were recognized the same week, I think is what's so important. Mm -hmm. And I think as we all are sitting here, we, we are all living it. We're, we're affected by it, mm -hmm. and both were great moments in our history. One negatively, and one was beautiful. And I think that as we go forward and are able to engage in civil debate, a debate amongst one another, that we have to remember that this was an important time of our, in our country. So thank you all mm -hmm. for sharing. Uh, and I want to thank you for being here this evening. On a Friday night, panelists are here, they're giving up their time to share with you in Montgomery County about their thoughts and feelings about our country and our state. Now, thank you for tuning in, panel, to Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show. 
For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken. Have a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. We'll see you in two weeks.